Well, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Dwayne Cattell and I'm one of the pre-hospital care specialists here at the SWARP. And I have with me today uh, Sarah Redfern, who is a registered midwife with uh, MOMNA, the Midwives of Middlesex and Area. Hi, Sarah. Welcome back again. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's, it's just wonderful. So today, this is the part two of our pre-hospital childbirth and emergencies uh, webinar uh, program. And we're going to be talking about some of the emergencies that occur in the pre-hospital setting when we as paramedics are called to assist women in labor. Um, and you know, Sarah, for the most part, um, we can never have enough review. Uh, with obstetrics, especially, you know, the last webinar was the uncomplicated uh, childbirth, uh, wet, basically like, you know, the, the vertex and, and the breach and that sort of thing. And now when, it, when we get into this, to these, these bigger topics, like these life-threatening, these critical, critical interventions that need to be performed, um, you know, we just don't do this every day. Um, you know, we, we see like the like chest pains and short of breath, cardiac arrest, you know, uh, fractures and that thing on a regular basis. But uh, the, the active labor and especially these, these life-threatening conditions, these emer true emergencies, we just don't see them every day and we don't deal with them uh, on a regular basis. Um, and so thanks for bringing your expertise to this because it really helps keep us uh, relaxed when we have you know experts such as yourself in the field and especially on the webinars to just to reassure us that we're trying to do what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah absolutely it, these emergencies that we're going to be talking about today are things that are rare and even as midwives that do this every day it's not something that we see that often. Um, we're prepared for them, we're looking for them, but they don't happen that often so hence why they're rare emergencies. Yeah exactly so perfect um, and just uh, reiterating the thing like you know for most most childbirth it, it's, a, it's a natural process uh, but sometimes things happen as a result so and I think it's good to go over um, these things today and uh, so once again thank you for being here it's incredible uh, it's just wonderful to have you here and sharing your expertise and knowledge with us I, I know I appreciate it I'm sure the rest of the medics that are listening in will appreciate it as well so thank you you're welcome thank you so our objectives today um, we're going to be looking at some of, like Sarah said, some of the, the very true, very rare pre-hospital obstetrical emergencies, uh, which is going to consist of the shoulder dystocia and the management of such, uh, prolapse cord uh, management, uh, and postpartum hemorrhage management. So with this, um, Sarah, when we look at shoulder dystocia, prolapse cord, and postpartum hemorrhage, uh, the, these conditions, can we manage them in the pre-hospital world, taking into account the, the tools and the training that we receive? Like, I mean, are these things manageable from a, a pre-hospital care perspective as opposed to like a, like a midwife perspective, like with the training we've received? Like, what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's something that you have limited tools at your disposal. You definitely will be able to... Um, address the concern, identify it hopefully, and use the skills that you've been taught to be able to manage what you can. Depending on the situation, sometimes the, the best thing you can do is sort of stabilize things and get to the hospital. Um, other times the situation may resolve um, either on scene or en route. Um, but we still are going to want follow-up care for, for both mom and baby in those situations. That's great. So, well, thanks, Sarah. And um, well, let's go, we'll move forward, and we'll look at our first obstetrical emergency that deals with uh, shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia is one of those things that is terrifying um, in the moment, and it makes the seconds that are happening feel like an eternity. So the most important thing to do at the beginning is take a breath because okay. you need to kind of get yourself in a good headspace and breathe. Yeah. And 
when we get into these shoulder dystocia, like the reasoning behind that is because the the shoulders get stuck or they're hung up behind the symphysis pubis uh, for the majority of the cases, and then that prevents the progression the progression and the descent of the baby, uh, which puts the baby at risk of hypoxia, and if if this is basically not fixed. Um, as far as life-threatening um, mechanisms, like why the shoulders don't deliver, like what what tends to happen? Like, I mean, I know their chest can't expand to breathe, but but what is what else is happening with that? Yeah, so it's kind of a, a multifaceted situation. Generally speaking, though, shoulder dystocias are not going to happen in a precipitous manner because, um, or in a pre- pre- precipitous birth because. Um, progress has often been slow all along. So it would be something where the person has time to get into the hospital. More common with forceps or vacuum deliveries than they are with a spontaneous um, birthing situation. So that's nice to know. Um, What happens is basically the head is born and then the shoulders are stuck on the mom's symphysis pubis. Um, And that as you said, doesn't allow the baby's chest to expand. It also causes cord compression, or we have to assume total cord compression. There's likely some blood that's getting through and therefore some oxygen getting through the baby, but we have to assume that there's nothing getting through to the baby. Um, And so it can be a life-threatening condition for baby. Um, And usually is able to be resolved within a couple of maneuvers. Okay, well, that's perfect. That's that's more that's settling for us, right? I yes. mean, at least we know that we can manage this in the field. So, one of the telltale signs that you have a mum with a baby that has shoulder dystocia is turtle signs, which we are going to examine in our next slide. So, what is happening is that it looks as though the baby's head is being retracted, like a turtle that's pulling its head back in, but not not as fast, not as aggressive, not like it's a frightened type mm-hmm. of thing, right? Uh, it is much more subtle. Um, and the baby's cheeks, because the head is essentially birthed, they appear chubby because when the baby stretches out, to my understanding, like it just, it's kind of, it's almost looks like they're getting pulled back in and the, and the, and the, 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 the skin and the fat of the chin just, and the cheeks just kind of come up. Um, and it's basically squeezed upward. So, um, and some now the the chin will, will have a difficult time sliding over the perineum as well. There could be cyanosis mm-hmm. on the baby's head, right? Um, and the restitution or the turning of the head to basically line up to get delivered that doesn't usually take place. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So this mechanism isn't is not working well. So the restitution part where babies. Um, if you remember from our last conversation, they turn one way or the other to allow their shoulders to come out. This is all being impacted and um, not happening spontaneously. Okay, okay. Um, now, and when the anterior shoulder does become impacted um, on the symphysis pubis or the fetal, like the posterior shoulder, becomes impacted on the sacrum pronomeni, it results in the inability of the shoulders to deliver spontaneously in response to, to or in response to general flexion of the head, right? Right. And the, the trick of this is trying to determine when this is shoulder dystocia versus just a, a, a normal slow um, birth or slower birthing of the baby. Um, more common to see that slow birthing happening with the first time mom because okay. the tissues haven't already been stretched previously. So there's... It's that turtling, that's that kind of retracting back inside, that's the difference. The other thing to know is that this is after the baby's head has been born. So um, prior to, there's this gentle rocking that happens with each push. It's kind of like rocking a car out of a ditch. When the mom pushes, the baby will come forward, and then when she takes a break in between pushes or in between contractions, it will retract. That's not turtling. That's normal delivery. Okay, Okay, so we're, um, you know, kind of two steps forward, one step back is a a normal part, but once the head is fully out, 
um, we want to see that restitution happen and then we want to see the expulsion continue and if it's not continuing out but sucking back in that's when we're concerned about shoulder okay. dystocia. Okay and this needs to be dealt with quickly because we're worried about irreversible hypoxia and that can occur in a, within about eight minutes of noticing the, the turtle yes. signs, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and, and really, eight minutes will feel like an eternity. 30 seconds feels like an eternity. So it is really helpful to have sort of a guide on how long it's taking at this particular point in time. Um, if you can have your partner call out, we do it in 30 second intervals because okay. um, that's helpful. So if it's only been a minute, it's just a minute. It, that's totally fine. But in now, if you're encroaching on two or three, then we need to be doing something because we want to get that baby out. Want to get that baby out, and it, and also with a strong traction on that fetal head, you, there can be brachial, mm -hmm. uh, there, brachial plexus injury, mm -hmm. um, and that's why pulling on the baby is not an effective technique in order to get them out. Right. We don't. We don't want to either impact the shoulder more, which might happen if you're really putting a lot of pressure on the baby's head. Um, or strain and cause that brachial injury. Okay, and it's also important to note that um, as well as that if the cord is present, we don't want to clamp and cut that cord prior to that baby being delivered because um, if it's clamped and or if it's clamped and cut, uh, and then it ends up being a shoulder dystocia, well. We've now we've just basically cut off their oxygen, they're cut off their blood flow, their oxygen flow, and now we have a baby that's trying to transition from being a water breather to an air breather that is stuck in a mom's vaginal canal with the inability to expand their chest, uh, you know, to get some, you know, room air into their into their lungs, which is a this is a very bad situation to be in. Right. Yeah, if you do see a nuchal cord there, if you can loop it over the baby's head if it's quite tight, because that might be contributing to the lack of descent that's happening. Um, if you're able to do that, that's great. But any amount of blood that can get through that cord is going to be beneficial to the baby. Just keeping in mind, we have to assume that there's not anything getting through. Okay, perfect. So when we start to manage the shoulder dystocia after we've noticed the head is birth, it looks like it's retracting back in, all the signs we talked about, it's, it's essentially done in five steps and it is kind of a two person process. So you and your partner, you know, you'll perform these procedures together. And also it's good to note that we want to keep mom informed and communicate what is like the severity of this and what is going on. And generally these moms will let us perform these procedures because they want their baby. Absolutely, yeah. That, I've never had a mom in this situation that didn't um, comply with everything that we asked. And we do say that um, if we were in this situation, we, we start to use our midwife voice where we're a lot more demanding and <laughs> requiring <laughs> things instead of asking. So it's no longer like, would you like to move over or can I lay you back down? It's not like that. It's like, Lay flat, our feet back, knees up by your shoulders. Like, I need you to do these things. And they know in that moment when you're being very directive that there's a reason for it. So oh, you can definitely say babies, baby seems to be stuck and I need to do these things to help get the baby out. Okay, perfect. So I guess the steps when we go through the, the ALARM acronym, um, the first thing we do is we ask for help. If there's family members in the residence and if mom is okay with them helping, uh, helping out, uh, get them to help with this. Um, you know, while at the same time you and your partner, uh, uh, your partner or you or your partner is maintaining the stabilization of the baby's head and that's like the hands over top of the ears, which uh, I think it was referred to in our original training as that prayer position, right, from the, mid, from the, uh, the midwife trainers. Then we need to, uh, this is all if mom is on her back as well. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are different positions for her hands and knees and we can talk about that too. Perfect. So then we get, if we go in that kind of order, so on the back, then we get the legs flexed up um, and those knees, and that's that McRoberts uh, position. So we want to get those legs flexed up uh, in the position that allows, it basically, like it allows for the movement of the, the, t the soft tissue and maybe stretch to open the pelvis a little bit more. But yeah, it really does make a very big difference. About one to two centimeters difference when you get that really big hyperflexion. So that may be enough to release it. Um, if you tell a mom that, you know, like when you're asking for help, she can be one of the people that you're asking to help too. So you're asking her to pull them back, but think of relaxing her hips 
open and wide. Open and wide. Okay, that ma- that makes total sense, right? Yeah. So if baby hasn't delivered yet, um, then we can apply some uh, super pubic pressure. Um, so we go above the symphysis pubis, not on top of it, go above the symphysis pubis and with one hand, or at least for us, we push, essentially just push straight down. Yeah. But if mom is, if, if mom's having a contraction, well, just when you're about to apply that super pubic pressure, um, we want to wait for that contraction to finish because we're not going to be able to fight that, correct? Yeah, it would be very difficult. The idea too is that when the contraction is happening, more pressure is being pushed on the baby down into the symphysis pubic bone. So um, we're kind of fighting against bone. That's not going to be really helpful. If you can catch it the um, before the contraction happens, then you're able to put pressure externally that causes the anterior shoulder to adduct and that will create a narrower diameter and then when the contraction happens the baby can slide underneath the pubic bones you want to keep that pressure going when the contraction happens but starting it once the contractions are already happened you're not going to be doing anything so don't fatigue yourself right. and the depth and force is surprising we were told to keep it in our minds the depth and force that we would do for adult CPR. And mm-hmm. I mean, that for a lot of us, that was a very difficult. We're like, are we going to hurt the baby? We're going to crush the baby. <laughs> like, well, even in the you know, in a bad situation where these maneuvers do cause a, a clavicle injury, a broken bone. You have a live baby with a broken bone. Yeah, it's better to have a baby that has a fracture as opposed to a stuck dead baby. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. So, and if if baby doesn't deliver after we kind of, we do that super pure pressure to try to narrow up the shoulders, adduct the shoulders together. So then we're going to roll mum over and that's called the Gaskins uh, position. Basically hands and knees. And it's not like log rolling somebody onto a fracture board. It's like a big, wide yoga stretch to hopefully just move and jostle things around. And right, yeah. And this position is actually the only obstetrical position that's named after a midwife. So Gaskin was a very famous midwife because midwives often have women delivering in hands and knees anyway. Right. Um, and so it this often reduces the risk of having a shoulder dystocia in the first place because it's a better position but definitely trying to get them in to that position is very advantageous or in a situation where if they were in the water um, like we talked about in our last um, webinar you would need to get them out sometimes the act of getting out of the tub is enough to release the, the right. shoulder right. but if they do get out I would try hands and knees first hands um, knees because first. it is a really good position now there was a couple different schools of thought so if we have say we we're gone through we're going through the alarm acronym mm-hmm. um, and we get to the Gaskins position we're thinking okay the first things haven't worked we're gonna get in the Gaskins position there was a couple different uh, schools of thought with just with and it's fair um, do we wait for the contraction to finish or do we if the baby doesn't come out then do we immediately start going into our next step um it's a good question and uh, and this isn't a great answer but it's going to depend upon how frequent her contractions are okay okay so if she's somebody who's having contractions five minutes apart you don't have time to wait for the next one makes sense Right? Because yeah. now we're already at least five or ten minutes into a shoulder dystocia. Um, also, if somebody were that far apart with their contractions, I don't wait with shoulder dystocia for a contraction to push. I have her try pushing without the contraction. Okay. Um, contractions are definitely advantageous to getting more progress <laughs> with pushing, but um, it's better to get the baby coming out, and if we can get those get the shoulders out and then we'll make more progress fantastic um if you've got somebody that's having contractions every two minutes you can wait until the next one or you can go ahead and do it while it doesn't matter because the act of getting them over may have changed what's going on right absolutely so and then so if we roll them over, have the mum the gas, say we wait for the contraction and baby does it at the same time baby hasn't delivered so at the same time we were, were looking for that posterior mm-hmm. hand and that's that's mum's posterior so the hand should be because she's on her hands and knees the hand or the arm should be close to mum's bum yeah correct yeah, absolutely if it's there um, if it may it's not there. be there but yeah if it's there um and then ideally you want to kind of 
like we talked about with reach where we were talking about how swooping the hand yeah. over the chest and up um, that's ideal if if it's too vigorous it might cause tissue trauma again in mom again yeah. not terrible if we have tissue trauma as opposed to having a dead baby that is preferable yeah and it's a gentle if the hand is there we grasp the hand gently in the wrist and just try to sweep it out Correct. and but if we're meeting a lot of resistance just leave it alone because the arm could be folded around or it yeah. could be the opposite arm yeah. right exactly so good um yeah so and if that so if that doesn't work uh that first round of the alarm and then baby doesn't deliver, so you, we're going to switch positions, uh, and then one person's going to be in that prayer position, just stabilizing the head, basically getting ready to catch the baby when it when it delivers. And then your partner would run through. We try to run through that acronym again. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And the thing too is, even when the shoulders do come out, a lot of times those babies. They tend to be a bit on the, the chunkier side, so there it's like pushing for the chest and the tummy and the thighs. <laughs> the whole you're pushing the whole yeah. way out, um, so it's not they don't tend to slip out right after the shoulders are released. It does tend to be a bit of a an effort to get the baby all the way out. Right. So if we so we've done the alarm once, and now we're doing the alarm a second time, and if baby doesn't. A baby has not been delivered after that second round, which we're thinking could be in the neighborhood of eight minutes. Mm -hmm. Like you know, we need to get that mom on the stretcher, and we need to um, we need to get going. Oh yeah. And then keep performing these procedures in the back of the truck. Now, how are we how are we going to do this? I don't know, but it's going to be interesting when the yes. time comes, right? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting. Um, as far as Sarah, when we talk about I know we talked about the alarm in the alarm acronym in the sequence, like mom is posterior, so she's on her back. Mm -hmm. So if mom is already in that hands, knees, that Gaskins position, so we would just kind of work through the acronym that way, right? We would start that position. Yeah, or? you could you can start in any <coughs> position. So you can start hands and knees and then try flipping over again because you can't do something like super pubic pressure with a mom on hands and knees. Right, right. So um, it's just about keep trying you don't know what's going to release enough to have the baby release right and uh, i mean it's nice because if we if if we could have mom on her back but i mean that maybe that's not necessarily so, so if you're on their back it would be alarm but say if mom is already on her hands and knees then we would kind of go malar right. and then and then we do it once and then if that doesn't work then we switch and we're going to malar mom a second time right Absolutely. you just kind of work through the yes. work through it right yeah and keep in mind for McRoberts, we want um, mom to be completely flat, like okay. on, um, like when she's on her back. So no pillows behind her head, no oh, crunching okay. up. It, the idea is very flat, very back, very wide. So it, that makes sense because then gravity would that gravity helps that anterior shoulder. Maybe maybe a little bit. Yeah, right. exactly. And if if moms are inclined. Um, Often it doesn't make a difference, but in this situation, it could be putting in just enough onto the super pubic pressure, or sorry, pu super pubic spot that the pressure is not releasing. Whereas if she's flat, then we're just going to have gravity help us try and get under. The yeah, that makes total sense. Makes total sense. So as far as um, because as you know, medic, we're very. Well, how often does this work? Like, mm -hmm. like what? What's it like? How, how long does it take a drug to work? How long does a drug last? Like, how long is this gonna? Ha so, as far as your experience, or uh, and maybe if there's actual numbers, like, what do you th shoulder dystocia? Like, what's the these maneuvers? Do they have a good success rate? Very. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, it's really unusual for this not to work, and within two maneuvers. So oh, okay. you should be able to do, and often people will combine, like McRoberts and super pubic pressure are often being done at the same time. Okay. If you do that and then you do Gaskins, it would be unusual for that not to work, or vice versa, you're doing Gaskins and then um, doing McRoberts. It, one of those things should have released the baby. It should have released. Yeah, it's very unusual. There are other things that that we do, but they're more internal, and that's outside of the scope of paramedics. Yeah, that's yes, that's right. That's why you are a midwife. <laughs> very good. 
So just some of the complications that may arise from a baby who's had a shoulder dystocia, uh, asphyxia, uh, you know, from prolonged time of essentially being trapped, uh, the brachial plexus injury from the forceful contractions and the impended pinching of that brachial plexus. Sometimes there's, uh, there's fractures to the clavicles and the humerus. Um, it is noted that there could be some neurological uh, impairment as a result of the lack of oxygen uh, with and that couples with the distal nerve damage from the prolonged compression. A pneumothorax may develop from a fractured clavicle. Um, you know, there's different things here and mum would could have some postpartum hemorrhaging and maybe some perineal uh, trauma or tearing and that sort of thing. But as we said before, uh, it's, it's better to have a baby, to have a fractured clavicle or a fractured humerus that is out than to have a baby that's still stuck and in cardiac arrest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that often these babies, when they are born, um, they tend to be a little bit more stunned. That was a hard birth for them. Okay. Um, so expect that you're going to need to do at least some NRP. Okay. Stimulation for this baby, definitely. Um, make sure you're rubbing their spine with your knuckle. They hate that. Okay. Um, <laughs> we want to really irritate this baby. Um, so that's going to be important. And also breathe, right? Exactly. You have to, sometimes they can come out of this and they're fine. So it's really important at the end of getting the baby out for you to take a moment and really assess what's going on. Don't assume that you're going to end up needing to also resuscitate a baby while having a mom hemorrhage. That, those things may not be okay. occurring, so you need to just look and see. Um, definitely, we do anticipate a higher than average um, rate of hemorrhage and certainly perineal trauma in um, these situations. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you, that's awesome. So we'll move on to our next pre-hospital emergency and we're going to discuss uh, the condition of a umbilical cord prolapse. A prolapse cord is, is a, it's a critical situation because the blood flow, uh, like it's the, the life supply of the baby is, is compromised because if that cord is hanging out, as we see in the middle uh, slide, uh, that cord is hanging out, we automatically assume that it's compressed. It is rare, but it's, a, it's, com it's very life-threatening to the baby. Like mom, physiologically, like physically, mom will probably be fine. Um, mm -hmm. it, it may be a different story psychologically of what's going on, but, uh, but as far as uh, physical health, uh, she'll probably be okay. Um, and the only true way to fix this, like a, a cord prolapse, is a cesarean section, um, unless the birth is happening very, very quickly. Right. Um, and so that, because that baby needs to be taken out to remove compression of the cord. Um, and as far as how we manage this in the pre-hospital world, so this is a very, um, this is a it's a it's a very invasive procedure, and we we need to be we need to be very cognizant of, of, of many things with this. Um, the first thing we need to do is communicate this to mom that this is a life threatening condition that can lead to the death of their baby um, if if it's not managed quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the next thing we need to do well, and we need to get permission to do all this because this is this is very. It's an in, for lack of a better word, it's an intimate mm -hmm. type of, it's, it's very invasive. Um, second, we want to get mom onto her, her knees, almost in the knees chest position. We want to get her posterior up nice and high in the air. So with the thought, if we can utilize gravity to, with the, with the process of if the cord is wrapped around the baby, that it would just kind of draw the cord back inside. Uh, into the back into the vagina um, because if it is wrapped around the baby gravity will just give maybe the baby will shift and it'll drop down um, and if it goes back in well fantastic fantastic let's get on the stretcher and the exaggerated sims position uh, which is left lateral recumbent and then kind of wedge the hip up with a, a pillow or two just to, to keep everything there right yeah. but if this doesn't work now we need we need to talk to mom about this and and again I can't stress enough we need to get permission to perform this procedure with the very clear messaging of like the risks involved and when we're reinserting the cord 
that once we have coupled that cord gently and put it back into the vagina that the fingers or hand is going to be there because we have to relieve the compression and we have to maintain that relief of cord compression um, for the entire transport. Right. So you're, what you're doing is you're cupping that um, cord in your hand and placing it back inside the vagina, but also using your fingers to uh, place on the skull of the baby and put, keep the pressure up off of the cord so that the blood can keep pulsing. Most moms would be agreeable to this, but keep in mind you don't know her history, right? right and so yeah. there's a lot of um, variables that go into what someone is okay with mm -hmm. and explaining the reason and her giving permission sometimes is all that's necessary. Right, right. And I think it's important to note that, you know, our, our hand, fingers, whatever the case may be, we're not going to be, that's, that's going to be there for, like I said, the entire duration. And it's only if a, if a physician or a nurse or, um, say the midwife, say you arrived on scene now, mm -hmm. we're, we're the, those are our resident, like we're, those are the only people we're kind of, that's the only time our hand will be removed and Right. switching out so to speak yeah. right if we were to switch out in that situation or perhaps it might be once mom is in the OR and the section has started and that baby's being lifted off your fingers that's incredible and like that's yeah that's that's a long time it's a long time it's a long time yes um and remember as well um mom can either stay in that kind of knees chest position or whatever position works for them once we get them on the stretcher and um but they have to be safely secured. That's that's the other big piece. Um, and like like Sarah said, kind of like we need to taper our gloved fingers and, and couple that cord and be sure not to compress it and very, very gently reinsert it. And again, once we have reinserted the cord, we're going to kind of trail the cord or follow along the cord to find what the first thing that's compressing. And it could, could be the head could be the hip could be mm -hmm. a, could be a leg yep. like we we really don't know yeah whatever the presenting part is <laughs> yeah and then relieve the compression um and i think it's important to note that um like we're f we're fighting the uterus pushing down mm -hmm. the entire uh the entire transport the entire time we're with that with that patient um, and that pressure, that uterus can exert a lot of downward pressure, like like yep. like 120 pounds, or I, I don't I don't know the exact number. I kill they, they I saw a formula once about how much, and but it's it's Sarah. Yeah, it's yeah, incredible. it's a lot of pressure, and so it depends on how active her labor is at that point in time as to how much pressure there's going to be, and depending on the length of the transport time, you may end up finding out that this baby is actually coming down and you need to just expedite the delivery as opposed to trying to keep the baby on the inside because you know if especially if she's had multiple babies before she might be able to put to push this baby out in three minutes okay so yeah. that's yeah. a possibility too yeah. that makes sense yeah um so and like i said before it's a very it's a very rare condition it's a very invasive condition and we need to we need to kind of uh, look about five, ten steps ahead and anticipate what we need to do. Like watches need to come off, rings need to come off, clear communication, how we're going to position on the stretcher, the logistics with loading mm -hmm. and unloading the patient, timing to perform the procedure, that all comes in. And the biggest question that generates conversation around this procedure has to do with uh, when to put the cord back in. So do we do this if say if mom is on her hands and knees and have mom crawl the stretcher do we get mom in the back of the ambulance and then reinsert the cord the directive does speak to reinsertion of the cord within four minutes of the cord becoming prolapse so the sooner the better um, but how and when do we reinsert the cord uh, when it's only the two of us like how is this going to work because um, we can't lift the stretcher Right. With, with just one person like yeah. it's that's not going to happen and I think it is it reasonable to get mom in the back of the ambulance and then I mean if it's just my partner and I and no one else is coming to help is it reasonable to get mom on the stretcher quickly get in the back of the truck then do the procedure yeah well and the thing is 
um, as you mentioned, it, it sp the directive speaks to doing this within four minutes of the cord prolapsing. The chance of you having already been on scene and then the cord prolapsing so you can do this is very minimal. So yeah. much more likely this has occurred then she's called 911. And right. then you had to transport to the location. And now, so you could be 10, 15, 20 minutes after the prolapse, right? Like there's a, a lot of variables in oh. there. So the most important thing is to, to start the transportation if you need her to help get into the ambulance so that you can do that. I mean, we've talked about scenarios with like, what do you do if you're in an apartment building and you have to go down an elevator and there's no way that you could be holding a cord and still get the stretcher in the elevator because you can't get into that position. So is it better to just get down, get into the back of the ambulance and then do it? I think if we use good, good clinical judgment, because um, every situation, like you said, is going to be different, right? Absolutely. It's going to be different and just document, just document the reasons why, um, you know, and, uh, you know, however we do it we justify why we've done right. it that way and I wouldn't delay loading just okay. because of having your hand in right like yeah. it, you know um, it might be a case of recognizing that this needs to be done but it, you need to get her loaded so how can you do that quickly if you know the fire department's coming for a lift assist but they're 10 minutes out you're probably better just to get her loaded get, get and then okay do it. okay well, that's, that's settling then because the four-minute thing was like, <laughs> it's just you and I. How are we going to do this? Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> Thankfully, it's very rare. More common if there was multiples. More common if the baby was in a malposition, so like a transverse lie or in a um, footling breach. Those are the situations where we would see it more likely. Okay. Um, but... Overall, it's not a common situation. It's not a common situation. That being said, um, at, I know that we as midwives will tell our clients prophylactically, just on the safe side, if they have um, extra amniotic fluid or and their baby is higher, or we're feeling that the baby's higher and not well into their pelvis. If the, your water were to break, this is what I want you to do. So it's the hands and knees, chest possession. Right. You know, call nine one one if we're really worried. And I've had one person ever One. have that happen so yeah. it's rare um but it can happen. and it can happen yeah so once we have mom all loaded up we've done this procedure and now we also need to be aware um it's not a bad idea when we're on our way to the hospital like call ahead you know mm -hmm. to have somebody there to help us unload security if there's a crew there um you know just because you know, we, we have to think about like all the other stuff, like, okay, like sheets, blankets, wind yep. <laughs> in the, like, I mean, you know. Uh, of course, this is going to happen on a Wednesday at noon so that the hospital okay. is jam-packed. <laughs> Yeah, like I, you know, like we want to, we want to provide dignity and privacy. We always do, but in, this is like, we go above that now because right. it's a very, very, um, unique situation yes. um, you know moving through corridors where there might be a public presence we have to think about all that to keep the patient covered up and um, you know it's 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 dignity for mom mm -hmm. it's dignity because it's a very private thing um, and um, one of the other things um, is that we shouldn't be checking or, or palpating for a pulse and they're like actual palpating the cord because when we check for a pulse, we sque we'll squeeze, we'll push down and put pressure. And the reason behind this is that we can cause cord spasm, which could lead to more vasoconstriction and more fetal hypoxia. And uh, we can appreciate if we feel a pulse, mm -hmm. but that does not mean necessarily, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, that doesn't necessarily mean we may have blood flow there, but there could be up in, up inside, maybe the cord is, is blocked off in a different area and there's no... Usually, if you're feeling something, it's because the, it's all through, but it will be restricted. And keep in mind that what you're feeling may not be the appropriate heart rate for a fetus, right? So right. we're looking for heart rates between 110 and 160 beats a minute. Okay. You might think, oh, this feels really good, but it's 60. For us, right. that would actually be very scary. Yeah, it's, it's not a good thing. Not right? a good thing for a baby to have a heart rate at that. So as far as directly palpating the cord, don't don't... Yeah, don't compress it, but you can appreciate it for sure. Okay. 
And we, we talked a little bit about this before. One of the best practice positions is exaggerated sims, which is essentially on their left side, like a left ladder recumbent. And then we kind of uh, elevate the, put something like a pillow or something mm -hmm. or a wedge underneath the left hip. And this, this also promotes safety um, uh, for the patient, for transport, and it has gravity work in our favor, right? right? Um, and remember um, that if the baby is birthing while the cord is prolapsed, like, if you, we birth the baby, the prolapse cord goes away. That's right. <laughs> like, yeah. Like and if, the blood flow will be returned and baby will start to breathe. Like if, in it, yeah, in it, yeah, exactly. So just uh, continuing on with prolapse cord, we're going to be looking at some positions that will benefit us in the ambulance as far as treatment and transport of the mom who has this prolapse cord. Yeah, there's some good... Um, pictures to kind of show what we're talking about for the hands and knees and the cord or the uh, elevating the head off of the compressed cord. And like that's the exaggerated sims in that in the top left corner, right? And I mean that's a safe transport position for us. That's yep. if anything, that's probably the safest out of. Yes. Right. Um, and uh, as far as um, like your experience with cord prolapse and things like that. Um, so how, when you position, I guess, is every, is every situation different of how you're going to utilize? Like, I know we're supposed to, according to our directive, which we're all trained by the, the midwives, that try to get mom in that hand, knees chest position first with hopes that the cord will, gravity will draw that cord back in. Yeah. Um, as far as transport, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the greatest. But. It's not the greatest. It is the best position from from just a co cord prolapse situation. Doing the the knees and chest position will reduce the amount of compression on the cord the most. So that is helpful. Um, hitting bumps is never a bad idea because that might jostle things. Oh, okay. okay. So okay. Yeah. in my situation, the cord prolapse resolved when we hit the railroad tracks. And really? Yep. Yeah, so that was a that was surprising to me, but <laughs> fantastic because <laughs> we just jostled enough that the cord was able to go back inside. And well, that's fine afterwards, yeah. which was great. Yeah. So and just once again, uh, as paramedics, we we need to obtain consent from the patient to perform this life saving skill. Uh, our advanced life support medical directives are mainly elevating that presenting fetal, fetal part up and off the cord. It is a widely, this method is widely accepted as a first response to cord prolapse and in conjunction with a timely C-section, which helps reduce mortality. And once again, we cradle that cord uh, in the examining hand. We apply some digital pressure to the fetal presenting part and lift the fetus off the cord. Uh, the cord pulse should become strong once the compression is relieved, yes. uh, we want to maintain that uh, manual elevation until transfer care in the hospital. Um, and we could transport in the knees chest position or the exaggerated sims um, if there's ad if if it's adequate. I mean, we got to think about the distance to the hospital, the patient's uh, mobility, that kind of thing. Uh, if there's a malpresentation, so or a cord prolapse, we want to consider the relevant documentation. So if we have all this, what do we need to document? You know, if the in membranes are ruptured, we document the color of the fluid, the malpresentation if it's known or if it's suspected. Um, when the cord became prolapsed, if we can get that time, if we can appreciate the pulse, does it feel strong, does it feel weak, is it fast or slow? What did we do? The actions for all this, um, the position we put mum in, um, and if we if there's an elevation of a presenting part, um, you know, uh, we need to document it. What was it? Do we was it was a arm sticking out? Was it the leg? And like, it may be difficult to tell. Yeah, yeah. Like we don't we don't know, right. right? It's hard to tell sometimes yeah. which presenting part it is. And then if baby does birth, then we start documenting down the. The time the baby, that like gives the yeah. birth of the head, the time the, the time the placenta delivers, um, if there's any bleeding, um, you know, what type of bleeding, if it's mild, if it's moderate, severe, are there clots, and how much, how much volume, right? Right. So, very good. Okay, well, we'll move on to our last pre-hospital emergency, which is postpartum hemorrhaging. 
So postpartum hemorrhage is, is truly a life-threatening emergency. When we recognize it, it needs to be dealt with very quickly. Um, so with postpartum hemorrhage, there's only two outcomes. Either the bleeding stops or it doesn't. Correct. And there's a lot of different reasons why postpartum hemorrhage takes place. And most of these surround um, can surround the five T's, which involve the uterus. So uh, respectively, they are the tone of the uterus, if there's any trauma to the uterus, uh, the tissue itself, um, like fragmentation, uh, thrombin, which is kind of the, the clotting factors and that. And, and then the fifth one is, they actually say it's called tinkle, so to avoid the bladder because you're essentially, with that, with that last piece, you're competing for space mm-hmm. for the uterus to contract down on itself. Yeah. And if we have mom void her bladder, we've made, we've made ample room now. Right, the, the bladder isn't pushing the uterus up and out of the way. It's able to contract more effectively. Yeah. The most common of these is going to be the tone and the, the trauma to the, the uterus or the cervix or the vagina. That's um, where the blood is coming from, most typically. Most typically. And I think it's important to know as, as medics, we don't need to try and remember why these things contribute to the fact that mom is bleeding but more so that there's an elevated awareness to be prepared um, like you know if we if we, if there's trauma to the atom we need to be prepared for a postpartum hemorrhage if there's if they say well I have a clotting disorder we need to be prepared like this if with this baby comes we may have to deal with this right mm-hmm. so um, and the uterus is a muscle that can lose tone which causes bleeding and it's no longer able to clamp down um, on the bleeding tissue and vessels and this can occur with uh, protracted labor or multiple births over time or even after a normal birth. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, and the loss of tone makes up to about 70%. Is that correct of all yeah. postpartum hemorrhage cases? Yeah, it is. And that means it's manageable, right? We okay. just have to get the uterus to contract again. And there's different ways that we can do that, either with pharmaceuticals or with manual um, methods of Manual compression. methods of compression. Yeah. Now, what medications would you would you be giving in the field? Like, and I guess it depends on which what type it is, or is it your choice? Or um, it depends on what's effective. Okay. Um, oxytocin is the first round of drug that we okay. use, and um, so whether we're in the hospital or in an out of hospital setting, oxytocin is the first round of drug that we use. Okay. We also have misoprostol, which is a tablet that we can use either sublingually or rectally or vaginally. Oh, okay. Not vaginally when you're hemorrhaging because it'll just get washed out. Um, And then also we can use ergonavine very easily. Those are the three drugs that as midwives we carry to out of hospital births. Oh, okay. All of them. Um, There's also hemabate and uh, carbitocin that we have available. So there's a lot of things. That's incredible. That's awesome. So lots of lots, lots of, of diff- drugs, lots and they work drugs. on different ways uh, on the uterus, which is why sometimes we choose a different drug. Choose a different drug. Okay, yeah. perfect. So it's it's good to note that for postpartum hemorrhaging, at least in the pre-hospital world, um, the way we manage it is different based on if the placenta is in or the placenta is out. If mom is postpartum hemorrhaging and the placenta is still retained. So as with all postpartum hemorrhage cases, we need to ensure that mom empties her bladder, okay? And this will allow for room for the uterus to contract. Establish an IV if you're IV certified and if possible to initiate fluid bolusing if required. Uh, get some oxygen on the patient deemed as necessary. Um, mom needs to try and get that baby to latch, okay? To start breastfeeding to re- stimulate the release of oxytocin. If, if baby will not latch, then oh, we need to direct mom to perform nipple stimulation to simulate that latching um, and because we need that oxytocin rolling, right? Mm-hmm. And no fundal massage is to be done when the placenta is still in or still retained. It's because essentially we, we would be ripping and abrupting and tearing that placenta, Yes. right? Like we always try, we don't want an abrupted placenta to begin with. We don't want a placental abruption and we don't want to cause one, right? right? Um, you know, this will cause more bleeding. So if the bleeding will not stop, uh, uh, we need to perform that bimanual external uterine compression, which is essentially grabbing and coupling the abdomen and the tissue and kind of squeezing it, squishing it together, either from like just grab a hold of the sides and squeeze together or the 
top to bottom type thing or on an angle. Um, uh, Sarah, as far as uh, as far as that uh, bimanual external uterine compression, I mean, we're essentially, we're essentially just trying to fold it over, like put, like putting direct pressure on it, right? Yeah, you're basically putting direct pressure on the uterus and trying to stop bleeding. Um, it's very painful, like excruciatingly painful, especially to someone who's just given birth. Okay. So expect that they're going to say no. Expect that they're going to want to grab your wrist and tell you to like take your hand away. So you need to be communicating as to okay. what you're doing and why you're doing it. And and they have the ability to decline until they pass out um, because of it being very painful. Very painful. I've had people who have said no, and I said to them very clearly, I won't do this procedure, and it wasn't quite this procedure, but similar yep. idea. Um, but if you're gonna tell me no, I, I won't do it. But I'm very concerned about your bleeding, and yes. I'm doing it for this reason. Do I have permission? And then they'll say yes, and then they'll say no. <laughs> like, okay. You can't tell me no, <laughs> and then I have command to stop. Yeah. Um, but knowing that she has the ability to say no and that you're going to listen is really important for women. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing to know is that just because the placenta hasn't come out doesn't mean that it might still be stuck inside. So what I would suggest doing is the attempt to deliver the placenta part that we talked about. Right. So there's a couple of very easy ways to do that. One, try and get mom into a more upright position. Gravity will help it come out. Um, if she feels a fullness in her a uterus, that's, or sorry, in the vagina, you're going to know that the placenta is coming. Um, and get her to cough or bear down. Um, okay. So I, I use the term like cough like you have a bronchitis cough, a big okay. hearty cough. Okay. Um, and that might be enough to get the placenta to come down or she can push if she still has energy for pushing. Okay, perfect, That that's great. So now if the placenta is out, mm -hmm. so the placenta has been, uh, we facilitated out or it just came out on its own. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, now it's 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 still essentially the same process. We're, we'll look at placenta very briefly because we need to get that bleeding under control, um, and it's uh, it's now safe to massage that uterus. But the same type of deal, um, you know, uh, get the IV established, fluid bowls if needed, get some oxygen on the patient if necessary. Um, mom, try to get mom to get that baby to latch, okay? Um, and if baby will not latch, then mom needs to. Uh, uh, stimulate her own nipples to simulate that latching effect which in turn will release the oxytocin and we're we can do that fundal massage at this like we know we should be starting to get thinking about doing this even right yeah. before this absolutely um, yeah one of the first things is to do the, the, the massage the fundal. the fundal massage and get permission to do that yes mm -hmm. knowing it's going to hurt and, and saying this is going to hurt but I really need to rub your uterus to make sure there's no clots on the inside because we want the bleeding to slow down there's also a certain amount of bleeding that is normal and expected after birth. Birth does not come without blood. Right. So um, what, what is considered normal is 500 milliliters. 500, okay. Um, and soaking a blue pad is about 300. Okay. So if you can kind of use that visual. Um, all that being said, we know that people are notoriously poor at estimating blood loss, right? Yeah. Especially... Um, in a situation like this. So if you get a big gush and then it all settles and there's just a little bit, great. Um, if it's trickling fairly consistently, that's actually more likely to be a heavier bleed than if it was um, more initially. And the clots can be deceptive. So okay. keep in mind that that can be a fair amount of blood yeah. in a clot. It's just coagulated blood, right? Exactly. So. Yeah, and then if all else, if all that stuff fails, so we're doing the fundal massage, babies, say if they've latched or whatnot, and nothing's working, the fundus isn't, it's, the uterus isn't building up, and it's not working, then we have to think about doing that bimanual external, but it's, that's the last step in yeah. this, in controlling uh, postpartum hemorrhaging. So, um, you know, there's also what the lack, another thing of uh, perineal tears mm -hmm. and that sort of thing but but it's managed just like we would with any type of um, bleed like direct pressure like really yes. really hard direct pressure yeah. to control that 
um, as far as perineal tears, like the, the bleeding, it will be bright red, yeah. but it's, it's not going to be pouring. It should it be yeah. pouring. And um, it's amazing what putting pressure on a tear, like any part yeah. of your body um, or a cut on any part of your body, the putting some pressure on will reduce the bleeding and potentially stop the bleeding. Good, good. So um, when we think about documentation purposes in the event when we have this, uh, an out-of-hospital birth, a pre-hospital birth uh, with postpartum hemorrhage, we want to think about the documentation, so like the time of the birth, the amount and the quality of the, the bleeding, the, um, like the, is it trickling, is it gushing, are there clots present, is the placenta in, is it out, is, there, is the perineum, uh, is it torn, is it bleeding, when the placenta was delivered, if that's applicable. Um, as far as looking at the placenta, I mean, we, we don't have a lot of training in that. I mean, we're just looking yeah. for fragmentation, so chunks missing. It's very tricky even for somebody who looks at them on a really regular basis. So it, it's not high on your priority list. Right. Take the placenta with you. Let somebody at the hospital have a look at it, but yeah. it's not high on the priority list of what to do. Yeah. And then we're also going to document when we've done the massage, how long we've done the massage, the response to that, uh, and if the bleeding has stopped, what time that has taken place, um, or if it's still going, we need to just remember we need to document all that down, right? Yeah. The other thing that um, I find can be quite helpful rather than just like continuously rubbing the top of the fundus is doing some um, pressure, so like okay. um, holding the, and pressing down the top of the, the fundus because that will often expel clots and you can feel the uterus contract really well underneath your oh, okay. fingers at that point in time. So. Oh, perfect. That's, that's good advice. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So in summary, we've gone over the following pre-hospital obstetrical emergencies and the management. So we've had shoulder dystocia, kind of looking for the turtling, don't pull, um, perform the alarm steps with your partner. We've looked at the prolapse cord. We want to communicate the critical nature of a cord prolapse, obtain permission, and provide digital um, digital pressure and manually elevating the presenting uh, fetal part up off of the cord and then transporting uh, because a C-section is going to be the only thing that's going to truly fix this. And we can transport them in exaggerated sims, um, uh, which is basically left lateral recumbent with the elevation under the left hip. And then the postpartum hemorrhage, we need to recognize and treat this life-threatening condition. It's, it's a life-threatening bleed. Resuscitate is required and attempt to improve uterine atony with fundal massage once the placenta is delivered. Um, and then as far as uh, getting the baby to latch or nipple stimulation, and then which helps promote oxytocin release. And then if nothing else is working, we do that bimanual external uh, uterine compression. So uh, very good. So... I hope everybody's enjoyed this uh, webinar today. And if you have any further questions, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us mm -hmm. here at the base hospital. Sarah's information is there. And uh, Sarah, once again, thank you so much for coming in today and doing part two. I know you, your time is precious and I value that. And we, we really do value having, having you come in and, and teaching us about the labor and delivery in obstetrics because it's like I said it's not something we do on a regular basis and we can never practice this and go over this enough but thank you so much for for coming in I, I really appreciate it you're welcome thanks for having me okay. thanks for joining us guys take care <laughs>